Well, and uh, welcome to Subfactors. So I'll uh, have a series of six lectures on Subfactors theory. These are very, very interesting things and uh, very general. So uh, I can imagine that uh, some of you guys have uh, already met things like tensor categories, quantum groups, Hopf algebras, planar algebras. So factors somehow is the level, uh, the level up is the highest level. These are the most uh, general things and also the most difficult ones. So you have to be uh, very, very modest in, uh, in doing them. There's a lot of things to be learned and also the thing itself is, uh, is very, very difficult actually. There are uh, very few people doing so factors. Most of them tend to uh, go into uh, yeah, planar algebras, tensor categories, conformative theory, quantum groups. So uh, there's almost no one I think presently really doing some factors in uh, the hard way because this is extremely hard. So uh, that's my remark for the future for, uh, for bright people uh, who can understand all this. So we'll have a look at um, all this in this series of lectures. Let's find the presentation for today first. So, uh, well, it's gonna be uh, just an introduction to Neumann algebras and uh, to one factors, and then we'll go slowly and learn a bit of, uh, of factor theory. So, in order to get started, uh, we need some operator theory. So, uh, we'll take a Hilbert space H, basically this will be the, the unique separable Hilbert space L2 of H if you want. We're interested in the linear operators from H to H, which are bounded in the sense that this norm, the usual norm is bounded. So uh, what's to be known about this is that, uh, well, this form of complex algebra, right? Because if you compose or make some you have inequalities, it's bounded too. Then um, this uh, algebra of operators, B of H is complete with respect to the norm. Uh, why? Because you have point like convergence, and that's your limit. It's not hard to prove. Also have uh, an evolution given by this formula. That's a bit as for the usual matrices. So uh, what's the proof of this? Uh, well, when X is fixed, this is linear. So it must be scalar product of, with something. You can call that something T star of Y, that's your T star. I find norm in evolution are related by this uh, tricky formula here. That's exactly as for matrices because uh, for usual matrices, in both cases, you get the, uh, the biggest eigenvalue in absolute value to the square. So that's the theorem. Uh, another remark is that uh, these operators are in fact just some infinite matrices. So if you assume that H has a basis uh, index by I, then H is L2 of I. And uh, if you have infinite matrices, I mean, the coefficients are just these guys as usual, and the adjoint is given by the usual formula. Uh, however, in practice, we are mostly interested in spaces of functions, for instance, L2 of 0, 1, or things like that. We don't have that an explicit basis, so it's better to think of operators and think some objects on, uh, on their own. Now, what are von Neumann algebras? All operator algebras, that's how von Neumann called them uh, when he started working on this. Uh, these are algebras of P of H, which are stable under the involution. Also, weakly closed means that uh, whenever you have a sequence which converges on point by somehow to t, the limits must be in your algebra. So, examples matrix algebras, of course, star stop algebras. Why just star? Because everything is weakly closed, of course. And in particular, the speaker example you just take a matrix and then you take the star algebra generated by it. Okay, that's your von Neumann algebra. So this means polynomials in M and M star. Now in the normal case where M commutes with uh, M star, uh, this is just the algebra generated by, uh, by M. Now, uh, what's, uh, there are many results in von Neumann algebras. Now the most basic one, which is fundamental, is that the commutative von Neumann algebras are exactly the algebras of the form L infinity of X, with X being a measure space. And uh, well, this is important because it tells us that fundamental algebra theory is somehow non commutative integration theory. So how does this go? Well, first in one sense, given a measure of space X, of course you have L infinity of X. You can view it as Neumann algebra on L2 of X, the function stack by left multiplication. And now comes the converse. So this is something more technical using some functional analysis operator theory. And it should be mentioned that uh, uh, the statement involves a little multiplicity in regard to the H. I mean, once you have this, you can always enlarge H. So there's a multiplicity there appearing too. 
No. Uh, well, before getting into more theory, uh, why not stopping here? I mean, that's more or less what you need to know. So you can perfectly stop here and uh, spend your whole life doing things like random matrices, for instance. So what are the simplest for my algebra as well, besides the commutative one and the matrix one, which are somewhat trivial tensor products of them. So Mn tensor L infinity of X. This is a so-called random matrix algebra. The elements are random matrices. And here is the result due to Wigner in the 50s, which is really amazing. So if you have a matrices with normal entries ID, and uh, ID up to the constraint that it's self-adjoins, then it then goes to infinity, the, uh, the distribution of the eigenvalues follows the semicircle law. Okay, the parameter t depending on the, the variance of the, of the entries. And uh, well, there are many proofs uh, for this, but a simple one is just the moment methods of compute the moments and with a big formula, you get some Catalan numbers in the uh, n big limits, which are the moments of the semicircle law. So this is just the starting of uh, something. You see, it's the, in the simplest of for Neumann algebras that we know, mn of c tensor L infinity of x, or matrix tensor abelian. And uh, of course, you can uh, spend a lot of time uh, in your whole life continuing Wigner's work, uh, understanding fluctuations of the eigenvalues and all that. So what we know as basic theory for for Neumann algebras, just these few things are just enough for, uh, for doing very interesting things. Now, if you want to go beyond this, somehow in a theoretical direction, you can also do free probability of a Kulesko. So you see, you have the notion of independence, which makes sense in this fundamental algebra setting, just like this. And you have the notion of freeness now. It's exactly like independence, but instead of uh, traces of uh, BC being B, C, and C, you take alternative products because these, these things don't commute in general. And uh, among the discoveries of Oikulescu is the fact that you have a free analog of the CLT. So what's written here is the CLT, you see independent uh, center variance T, the averages converge to the normal law. Now if you take exactly the same thing but replace independent by free, you get as limiting measure gamma T, this Wigner semicircle we were talking about in a previous slide. So uh, what's the proof? Well, of course, in the classical case, you have to linearize the convolution as done by log uh, Fourier. In the free case, uh, you have a transform to its scholar transform of Oikulesk to prove this. So you see, once again, this uh, doesn't use much. I mean, just the definition of Neumann algebras, and you get into really, really, really very interesting things related to this big Nars and circle law. So as a conclusion, you know, I can perfectly stop here with for Neumann algebra. That's, that's more than enough for doing interesting mathematics. But let's have a look at everything that can be done. There are many surprises there. So let's develop some general theory. So uh, the first thing uh, due to von Neumann beyond what's uh, being already said is that uh, the fact of being weakly closed is equivalent to be equal to the, the bicommutants. What do we mean by this? So a, you can take its commutant inside the of H and then the commutant of the commutants. And A is, of course, included in the double commutants. Equality means that it's weakly closed. So once again, proof operator theory uh, functional analysis. Another consequence, since commutants are always equal to their B commutants, phenomenal algebra appear at commutants. So that's interesting, uh, especially in relation with physics, many things in quantum mechanics appear as commutants for phenomenal algebras. Now, some technical comments too. For Neumann, of course, implies norm closed. So this means that it's a, it's a sister algebra. If you know what that means, well, that means it's norm closed. And uh, conversely, the von Neumann algebras, those which are weakly closed, can be located inside those which are norm closed. I mean, the sister algebras, these are the sister algebras having separable pre -dual. So this is very, uh, very understood the relation between sister and von Neumann. Well, else can be done uh, quickly in finite dimensions. So in finite dimensions, you have no topology. So you just take a star algebra, and that's your von Neumann algebra. And if you decompose the unit as a sum of minimal projections, P1, PK, each of these projections will determine a block, which is a matrix algebra. So finally, your algebra is just a sum of matrix algebras. That's the structure uh, CRM for, fin uh, for uh, finite dimensional von Neumann algebras. Very good, you have this. 
No, well, at the same level, but much, much more complicated is the reduction zero of Riemann. So the idea is somehow what we said there about finite dimensional algebras actually can be done uh, in general. So what's the idea? We know that the commutative Riemann algebras are L infinity of x. So in particular, the center is of, of this form. So let's write the center as L infinity of x. Then the trick is that the whole algebra decomposes as integral of algebras, each of them having the trivial center. That's what's called a factor. So, uh, well, the proof is, of course, by technical, but uh, this is, uh, well, in finite dimensions, it's just uh, what we were talking about before. I mean, these are the, that's your algebra, and these are the, the factors that appear, and uh, it's a discrete integral, it's a sum. So, in Johnson Hall, the idea is a bit the same. So once again, well, let's uh, let's see now how factors uh, can be classified. So factors are phenomenal algebras with trivial center, somehow the opposite to the to those which are commutative. And this falls into three classes: type one matrix algebras and B of H itself. Then type two, these are those having a trace, the type two one. And also, once you have a type two one, you can always tensor it B of H. It's called type two infinity. And then type three, uh, is, um, more complicated here. These are basically those without trace, but you can still uh, uh, classify them. They fall into some. There's a parameter lambda appearing there, and uh, Juan has shown that uh, this somehow can be recovered from the one factors. It's, it's very heavy stuff. So. Uh, because the conclusion of all this is that somehow, uh, if you look at this type one, type one is trivial, type three is very difficult, and uh, but fortunately reduces to type two. So it's a, it's all about type one factors. These are the building blocks of the theory. So that's the basic uh, classification, reduction theory plus these things on factors. Give you an idea of what the Fonemann algebra looks like. It's an integral of things, and each thing is more or less of one factor up to some uh, complicated constructions that can be applied to it. So it's basically a kind of integral of one factors. Now, once again, uh, this is the beginning of something. Uh, you can go even farther, but uh, I'm sure it's up here, and uh, why not? <laughs> so let's look into some examples now, especially the stone factors. Let's try to construct some. And uh, a very nice idea here is to, uh, to look at groups. So take a group, then the group algebra with the involution uh, g star is g minus one. Then you can make this act on L2 of gamma by left uh, regular representation, and then close, take the weak closure. That's the so-called Neumann algebra of the group. And when gamma is abelian as a basic example, of course, this must be L infinity of something, not something it can only be the dual group, right? And that's it, so that's the statement. Now, in general, of course, uh, when you see this formula, you say, we're not doing this in general. So even an arbitrary discrete group gamma are not necessarily abelian. We can define the Pontryagin dual to be in the abstract somehow non commutative space given by this formula, you can get your GSL of gamma. So that's we're going, you know, going now into non commutative geometry. We have duals for the discrete groups. This is very good. So, Let's try to understand a bit how this von Neumann algebra cell of gamma fit into this, this classification business. So first of all, they have traces. There's this obvious trace, I mean, delta G1 of group generators. So this means that we're away from this type three business. They will decompose as integrals of type one N and one factors. These are those having traces. So very good, we're into type two. Another thing is that uh, a group algebra is a factor when gamma has infinite conjugacy classes, the so-called ICC property. Uh, why? Because you can explicitly compute the center. Uh, so all this leads us some point to the representation here of the group, the reduction theory for group on Neumann algebras it's related to, to group theory. Very interesting. Uh, now in connection with what we're saying, so some applications for Neumann algebras, this is non-commutative geometry, I mean, definitely. So these group duals are somehow the, the non-commutative tori, right? The torus, the simplest thing, is the power of, of z. So uh, uh, that's a um, power of t, the unit circle. So it's the dual of a power of z. 
Z being a simple discrete group. So in general, this can be thought of as non-commutative tori. And of course, you can go far beyond, you can talk about small non-commutative shares, quantum groups, and also homogeneous spaces. And that's actually a very uh, nice and general example of an Neumann algebra I take. Uh, compact quantum group as a group inside, then you can form this quotient space, and on it you have a uniform integration. So if you have a uniform integration, you can talk about L infinity of G over H. That's very general. I mean, of course, when you take G to be a group dual and H to be one, you get this group uh, on Riemann algebras. But it also covers the spheres, many other things. So that's some fun idea. You can do non commutative geometry with the von Riemann algebras. So once again, uh, as it was the case with random analysis, is free probability. I was telling you that you can just stop there. Uh, here also, you can just stop here, the non commutative geometry of quantum groups and things like that uh, your whole life. But let's go beyond now and uh, see what else can be done for my algebras. So let's get back to the one factor first because these are some of the interesting uh, things. So that's uh, by definition of my algebra, which is infinite dimensional, trivial center has a trace. We can prove that trace is unique. And also very interestingly, uh, von Neumann and Murray discovered this. The traces of projections, a priori something between zero and one, can take any value between zero and one. It's a kind of continuous dimension property. Very, very interesting. Now, uh, besides this group algebra, there's a factor which is very, very interesting, the hyperfinite one. So that's the idea here. It's a discovery of Murray and von Neumann. No matter how you take inductive limits of one Riemann algebras, you close, quickly closed. When you're done, you get the same to one factor, independent of the limiting procedure. That's the so-called R, hyperfinite one factor. And you can actually prove that it's somehow the, the, the smallest. That's what's, uh, what means, uh, what's meant by hyperfinite. That's a tough result by Quan. And in fact, once again, Quan and then Hagia group prove that somehow if you look at the hyperfinite for Neumann algebra has been somehow the uh, smallest ones, I is the building block for everything. So you see, I mean, in case you just need one for Neumann algebra, that's your algebra R. It's, uh, it's uh, the, the central object. Now, relation with groups, uh, yeah, let's clarify this. So group algebra is hyperfinite when, when gamma is not being numbers. So now, if in addition, you have besides this property, meaning that it's a factor, you get the hyperfinite factor. So you see, looking at R, it's somehow looking at the amenable ICC groups and maybe their generalizations, one groups, things like that. So now that one factors, well, you can do some factor theory. So this is where we wanted to, to get. So if you consider an inclusion of one factors, this index is the, can be defined as a Murray von Neumann continuous dimension quantity. And what John discovered that uh, in, if you have finite index, uh, you can always take a reflection somehow of the original factor and you obtain a whole tower like this of factors. The reflection is obtained by, by adding the projection to the, to the big algebra. And these projections actually generate a copy of the temporary big algebra. That's his big discovery. It makes a lot of connections, statistical mechanics and many other things. And as consequences of this, I'll talk about all this in the following lectures. The index, when n is less than four, you can show that it's quantized somehow, can take only certain discrete values. And also that the, the, the um, diagram structure of the temporary algebra extends into a planar algebra structure. We thanks for this, all these commutants, which commutants actually classify the subfactors of my nominal case, that's some of the philosophy. So, is this interesting? Definitely, and very interesting because, in general, this suggests that AB uh, factor appears somehow by, by an action of the underlying quantum group of the big one. And these quantum groups are the most general quantum groups possible, more general than any kind of quantum group or tensor category or whatever other thing. What we met from free probability for instance, or non commutative joint is a very, very general. Any particular interest is a hyperfinite case. So classifying the subfactors of the hyperfinite factor, very good question. Okay, so I hope that you like it and we'll, uh, we'll get to, to 
unfold this very slowly in the next uh, five lectures. See you soon.